Even before she was a fully-fledged doctor, Kate Barker always had a fascination for the outdoors. Growing up, being out among nature felt like she was connected to the wider world, one part of a larger whole. She intuited from a very young age that the Earth had a system in place, full of millions if not billions of parts that all worked together in the hopes of achieving perfect balance. Humans, animals, and insects. Right down to the germs that were so small they couldn't be seen unless under a microscope. And then, of course, there were the plants, trees, flowers, and all manner of other flora that provided the world with so much more than making it look beautiful. And it was so much so that a young Kate wanted to devote her life to helping maintain our beautiful little blue and green planet and understand every part of it. The way she did that changed as the years went on. As a child, it was learning how trees take in carbon dioxide and water, then use the sun's energy to feed themselves and produce oxygen through a process known as photosynthesis. Then, in high school, Kate was writing and giving presentations on the importance of protecting the environment and conserving wildlife, trying to convince her classmates to see the world in the same way she did. By the time college rolled around, that protection took on a seemingly more proactive form, standing out on picket lines in protest when the college announced it would be chopping down its nearby woods to expand the campus. Eventually, she was made Dr. Kate Barker and awarded her PhD in Botany and Plant Science. She thought that would be when the real work began. Having climbed her way up to achieving her degree was only the first step. The next would involve working tirelessly to keep the world's greenery alive. After all, Kate had studied for years, learning about anything and everything to do with plant life, their different functions and structures, how each species had evolved and could be classified, and how they all formed part of the planet's ecosystem. Unfortunately, even for those with the noblest of intentions, the harsh, unforgiving laws of reality can tend to get in the way. In Kate's case, that came in the form of being snapped up for a job at a genetic research company. Sure, on the one hand, she did get to rely on all the information she had learned on her way to earning her PhD, but on the downside, all Kate got to use her knowledge for was receiving and tending to various plant samples. Getting asked occasionally to run tests on said samples was about the pinnacle of excitement in her job. Somehow, despite working with plants, Dr. Barker couldn't help but feel further away from nature than she had ever been. That was until an unusual specimen was brought to her department for analysis, something unlike anything Kate had seen in all her years of research and study. Although she didn't know it at the time, this unique plant would bring Dr. Barker closer to nature in a way she could never have imagined, because it was a sample of SCP-306. Of course, at the time, and even after the plant's anomalous properties began to take effect, Kate was completely unaware of this. When it was first brought to her lab, it seemed like just an ordinary fungus. No one had been able to successfully identify it, however. But if anyone could, Dr. Kate Barker was perhaps the best qualified person. Where was it found? She asked the lab technician as he handed her the sample secured in a sealed airtight container. Pretty close to here, apparently, the lab tech replied. Louisiana swamps are always full of mushrooms and stuff like this, right? Yes, that's true. There are quite a few different fungi native to Louisiana, Kate answered instinctively, like her brain was on autopilot. She was more focused on examining the sample in the box than the conversation. Uh, thing is, no one knows what kind this is, or if it's dangerous. I heard a rumor the locals used to call it frog rock, but apparently that was an older name for it, the technician added, garnering a little more than a mumble of agreement from the doctor of botany. Kate placed the clear perspex container near the window, letting the natural light of the outdoors give her a better look at what was inside. It was a portion of a dead tree, its bark soggy and darkened from the swamp water. Growing out of its side was a cluster of the mysterious fungus in question, looking more like pustules or a cyst, a tumor growing out of the dead wood, as if it had drained the bigger plant of all of its life. Kate's next few hours were spent taking samples of the fungus, keeping her hands and face covered as she scraped away parts of it to examine under her microscope. There was little abnormal about it on a cellular level, nothing in testing to suggest that the sample was toxic or directly harmful. All Kate could decipher about the plant was that it was related to a certain genus of fungi, known as Trichophyton, which includes the same parasitic varieties of fungus that can cause athlete's foot, ringworm, and similar infections in humans. Still unable to fully identify the species, Kate decided to take a closer look at how it was growing. 
Putting the container behind a safety screen, she opened it up and began to pull apart the sodden tree bark with her gloved hands. There was definitely some kind of mass underneath the bark, what Kate initially assumed to be the wood of the tree that the fungus had taken root to. Nothing could have prepared her for how wrong she was. As the bark split apart and crumbled away, it revealed what was underneath, a cottontail swamp rabbit. The fungi took on even more of a tumor-like appearance when Dr. Barker saw that it was actually growing out of the rabbit's back, having actually taken root within the poor creature's body. As much as the sight of it was profoundly upsetting, even a little sickening, the scientists and Kate knew that this was all just part of nature taking its course. Once she got over the initial shock, it was even a little fascinating. Her botanical expertise was second to none, and through that knowledge, she knew that more fungi grew in damp conditions, but she had never seen any genus grow from the biological matter of another organism dead nor alive. Could this mystery species grow in any biomass, even in a human being? Worried about that possibility, Kate went to store the SCP-306 sample until further testing could be conducted. As she placed it back in the container, her hand nudged one of the fungi's bulbs, causing it to expel a wisp of tiny spores. Not that she could see them, of course. They were microscopically small, but as they drifted through the air, the spores were drawn to Kate, up and towards where she was steadily breathing. The minute the spores slipped undetected into her airway, Dr. Barker immediately began coughing, feeling a disgusting, earthy tang at the back of her throat. She couldn't stop spluttering, instinctively raising her hand to cover her mouth. Her rubber gloves were still covering her fingers, coating in even more invisible residue from the fungus, and now Kate was unknowingly breathing in more. Excusing herself from work from the rest of the day, Dr. Kate Barker went home feeling sicker and sicker as every minute passed. A fever was rapidly climbing, limbs were shuddering, and still she couldn't stop coughing and spluttering as she tried to expel a foul, lingering sensation that refused to leave her throat. But those weren't even the worst symptoms. Two days had come and gone since the incident at the lab, and Kate still hadn't returned to her job. How could she? She felt awful and looked far worse. Large lesions had started appearing on her skin, rapidly turning into warts. Just looking at them made Kate's stomach turn, and on a few occasions, poking at them and feeling these alien lumps on her skin caused her to vomit. Every night she would go to bed, her body rapidly switching from sweltering hot, then becoming cold enough to cause Kate to shiver uncontrollably. At first it looked like the lesions were clearing, falling away from her skin soon after they had fully formed into warts. But the fleeting bit of hope that gave her was quickly wiped away when new ones started to grow in their place. This didn't just feel like the flu, or any other type of sickness for that matter. It felt painful on the deepest, tiniest level. During what little restless sleep she did get, Kate kept having nightmares about doctors looking at her cells under a microscope, watching them changing into… something else. It had been over two weeks since she had first been exposed to SCP-306's spores, and still, she hadn't been well enough to get back to work. Each time Kate had called the Human Resources Department to inform them that she still wasn't any better, they always came out with the same advice. Drink plenty of fluids, try to eat, and keep your strength up. Dr. Barker hadn't stopped eating or drinking, albeit at a very slightly reduced rate. Her appetite had been sapped, along with most of her energy, although she had noticed that she dropped a significant amount of weight in an alarmingly short amount of time. Three weeks later, Kate flicked on the bathroom light and barely recognized herself. Not only was she no longer at a healthy weight, but her skin. Something was very wrong with her skin. She had developed an abnormal pigmentation, a yellowish-greenish hue, almost like she had somehow developed jaundice. But to the touch, it felt a strange, almost rubbery texture. In fact, if she hadn't felt so sick, Kate would have noticed that her skin wasn't absorbing water the way it was used to either, displaying the same type of permeability as the skin of most amphibians. Two months had gone past, and nobody at the research company had heard a word from Kate. She wasn't answering her phone. A few of them were asked to go to her apartment to check on her, but she never came to the door either. None of them had any idea what had happened. They certainly didn't know about the changes that her body had undergone, and none of them painlessly either. The constant pain Kate had been feeling had gradually built and built, until it felt like parts of her body were twisting and contorting against her will and in unnatural ways. With the grinding feeling of her bones pulling each other as they shrank, her limbs were racked with unbearable agony. At the same time, her stomach had shrunk to the point where she wasn't even able to eat anymore. 
The same reduction was occurring to the rest of her organs, too. Heart, liver, lungs, brain. Everything was getting smaller, shrinking organs imprisoned within a skeleton that was also decreasing in size. Then, one morning, the pain had seemingly stopped. After a night spent screaming in sheer agony, tears streaming down her face, Kate woke up on the floor of her apartment under a pile of her clothes. But as she awoke, she instantly noticed something. Everything looked bigger. The whole room towered above her like she had been reduced down to the size of something much smaller than a human. She tried opening her mouth to say something, anything, but her lips couldn't form words anymore. Her arms felt strange, too, like their reach was somehow much shorter. The same with her legs that were now tucked under her body, her tiny, rubbery-skinned body. SCP-306 had turned her into a frog. It took Kate almost an entire day to figure out how to properly move around, first needing a long time to emotionally process what had happened to her. If she had still been able to, she would have been sick and cried endlessly, wailing on the floor. Instead, when she tried to make any noise, a tiny croak was all that emanated from the back of her hoarse throat. But before she could find a way to leave her apartment, something else found their way in. From way down on the floor, the men in their white hazard suits looked colossal, impossibly tall. Kate tried her best to dodge between the thick soles of their heavy boots as they came crashing down towards her from above, each one having enough force behind it to crush her in an instant. She leaped out of the way of one descending boot, only to be caught mid-air in a glass container. As the lid screwed tightly shut, sealing her inside, Kate was lifted up and saw a patch of the hazmat uniforms of the men that had come to take her away. A black circle, with three arrows pointing in towards its center, and an outline surrounding it. The Foundation put her in a glass tank with eleven other frogs, each of them looking almost identical to Kate, all climbing over each other, fighting for their own space in the tiny enclosure. From the moment she arrived, Kate could see the same thing in their gaze as they could see in hers. Sadness unmistakable even in those dark, beady little eyes. These were people, or at least they had been human beings at some point, but now anything on the outside that had made them unique, their individuality, had been taken away, and their minds had all been locked inside the same frog-shaped body as Kate now found herself in. Over the next few months, the Foundation had their scientists running a series of tests on the frogs, who were now all categorized under the collective designation of SCP-306-1. Even though she was unable to speak, Kate recognized their methodical scientific process, how they would test one or two of the frogs at a time, note the results, then change a variable and repeat the test to see if there were any changes. It was the same process she used to go through every time a new sample arrived at her lab. Watching the researchers reminded her of her old job, the life she'd worked so hard for, and was cruelly reminded that it was all gone now. Nobody would ever know where she went. She'd never be able to go out amongst nature in the way that she had always loved. <laughs> Kate had long since figured out the root cause of her transformation. A while after she had started to feel sick, she'd wonder if that strange fungus had anything to do with it. Seeing all the Foundation scientists and guards in their hazmat gear, only handling the other frogs with thick rubber gloves seemed to prove her theory right, and suggested that she and her fellow amphibians were still infectious. Still, she currently had no way of communicating with the Foundation personnel about what had caused her to change, although they seemed as if they already knew. Most of the tests involved the researchers putting Kate and the other frogs into mazes or making them solve puzzles or memorizing commands. Naturally, having once been human, they all picked it up quicker than the researchers expected. From their perspective, these frogs were displaying an extremely advanced form of intelligence. Gradually, the testing progressed, and the Foundation's researchers began attempting to teach the frog specimens to read and write, all skills that they had already possessed, even if some of them needed some time to learn how to hold a pen in their new sticky fingers. Kate herself was made to complete an IQ test, scoring 127 points. Now that she had a way to communicate with these scientists through writing notes, she and the other SCP-306-1s were asked their names. That was the moment the Foundation realized what they were. These weren't just frogs, but human beings who were now trapped in the bodies of frogs. Perhaps inspired by this human-to-frog transformation, or possibly as some cruel joke, one of the Foundation researchers, who went by the name Thompson, brought in a children's book and presented it to the collection of SCP-306-1 specimens. At first, Kate enjoyed the simplicity of the stories, 
and it seemed her fellow frogs did as well. But gradually, they all grew depressed. Maybe one of the stories featuring a prince being turned from a frog back into human form, while the twelve remaining specimens had yet to be presented with a magical cure for their condition. Or perhaps seeing something as simple as a children's book reminded some of the frogs of all they were still to do in their old lives, like starting families and now they wouldn't get the chance. Kate and some of the other frogs began writing notes to Thompson and another of the researchers who had been feeding them, Phyllis. They did their best to be reasonable with the Foundation, but also communicate how desperately they wanted to be set free. You have no right to keep us here, Kate wrote, under the towering stare of Phyllis and Thompson, feeling for the first time in a long while that she was actively doing something to make a difference in nature. We need to be out in the world. We need to be free. If she had more space on the paper, she would have tried to note down suggestions of places the frogs could be introduced, where they wouldn't pose any risk of disrupting the local ecosystem. The swamps of Louisiana, where the SCP-306 fungus had been found, were one such idea that came to mind. But much to Dr. Kate Barker's disappointment, she and her fellow frogs would only cause the fungi's infectious properties to spread, meaning their pleas with the Foundation fell on deaf ears. There was no other choice, nothing else they could do. They needed to break out. As night fell, Kate organized the frogs, gradually writing out instructions for how they were going to escape, communicating with them the same way she had with the researchers. Only this time, the others listened. Even if they couldn't be human again, they didn't want to live the rest of their short lifespans being locked up and tested forever. Kate marked down the time that Thompson and Phyllis usually fed the frogs and drew up a detailed strategy. If she could hide for long enough under the others, it might make it seem like one of the specimens was missing. The next day, researcher Thompson and researcher Phyllis arrived to feed the SCP-306-1 specimens, accompanied by security guards as always. While her colleague went to collect the feed for her to administer, Phyllis did a count of the frogs, 11. She counted again, only to get the same result. There was one missing. As she leaned closer to the tank, Kate trusted her fellow amphibians above to follow the plan. In a flash, the mass of frogs had leaped from their containment and pinned Phyllis to the ground as one. The room erupted into chaos. People turned frogs leaping in all directions as they scattered and made a mad dash for freedom. A gunshot rang out from one of the security guards trying to subdue the creatures, only for the stray shot to catch researcher Thompson in the neck, killing him. Leading the charge on her tiny rubbery legs, Kate jumped closer and closer to the exit. It was so close. If she could just get far enough away, she might finally be free to get back to nature. Now go and check out SCP-323 The Wendigo Skull to hear another terrifying tale of anomaly that could cause someone to undergo a horrific transformation process. Or if you're in the mood for more particularly peculiar plant life, why not try SCP-2800 Cactus Man?